Does the death penalty still work in Singapore? This is your daily catch up. Hi, mom. Okay, greetings everybody. We have a very special man here today and that's Minister Shamugam. Yes. Welcome, sir. So Thank you. recently, the death penalty of, of in Singapore has been in the spotlight and so we've brought Minister down to answer a lot of our burning questions. Mm. Yeah. First of all, can I just say that I find it very weird that like, we just decided to start a podcast together and then now we have a minister. <laughs> we have moved up in life, guys. Yes, Crazy yeah. is this. Damn weird. Super surreal. So for those of you who don't know, uh, minister has been the minister for law and minister for home affairs for quite a few years already, which makes him the perfect candidate to answer our questions. <laughs> yeah, so the most perfect. Okay. The most <laughs> very very pressure. You, you, so, you will get direct answers. Okay, okay, very good. Okay. Okay. Nice. So I've I've known uh Minister Shan for a few years now. So I've asked him a lot of stupid questions over the years. <laughs> and yet he still agreed to come here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for coming. But y'all have any or not? Before we get down to business. Wow. I feel like you have a lot. This is like my first time meeting a minister. Eh. Same. Ah. Same. <laughs> Hello, sir. Hi. <laughs> Actually, one of the questions that I, yeah, I have, okay. right, uh, is what is the most interesting like Request or, or that that somebody has had right during a like a meet the people session. Ah, uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is your stupidest question. You can ask. Yes, what kind of PG know. question is this? <laughs> I've been I've been an MP for over thirty years, so you know over the years there have been lots of uh, strange requests. <laughs> Most people who come in, they there's genuine need. That's about ninety eight percent. Yep. The two percent will come in. You know. There is a different motive sometimes. Like one guy came to see me very early when I was a very young MP to say that, uh, well, you must take care of health care. I said, yes. Therefore, he you know, give you advice, I huh? want a helipad on top of my block. <laughs> so because you say government takes care of people, so put a helipad so that, you know, anyone who is sick, my father who gets sick, we can and take the airlift him uh, on the helicopter to the hospital. What do you say to a resident like that? Because you, you cannot be like, what are you talking about? You, yeah. know? <laughs> you have to be respectful. Sir. You have to be respectful, but I think you also have to be firm. So I told him, look, I know you're not making a legitimate request. You're just here to take up time. And uh, I have many other residents waiting for me. Wow. Yeah. That's good. As a young MP, you would say that. Yeah, because, you know, there are residents who need help and uh, he wants to take up a huge amount of time and mm. by then i i can't remember but i probably already had spent about 20 30 minutes right and if i had let him he would have gone on for an hour so like what what was like your origin story of how you got into the ministry you no, know how you got yeah. into politics how you got into politics, politics. Yeah, yeah i got into politics in 1988 and prior to no that uh, the yeah you weren't born yet <laughs> <laughs> i was invited for tea sessions and um, i was 26 27 at that time I went for tea sessions, um, then there were long cool. discussions, and eventually I stood for elections when I was 29. Who, who gave you the call? My ex-tutor, uh, uh, Professor Jayakumar. No, no, that after that. Mr. you're not saying it like the way you said it the other time. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember when, when um, I spoke to Minshan last time, and he was first a private practice lawyer. And you know the tea sessions that they do, right? They invited him once and then he, he was still growing and, and he was telling me, la, if I'm not wrong, that he said, old man told me, I can see that you still have more you want to accomplish in your right. personal life. Then when you are done with that, you join me. And then many years later, right? He always kept in mind that he needs to wrap this up already. He needs to finish this already. And then when that was done, then he had that final tea. And then right. that's how he got into office. It's always over tea, yeah. Tea. I've tea. never heard of this eh, until I come here. Like, this whole tea <laughs> session oh, thing, I never heard yeah, before. It's like some session. quote. So from what I know, lah, huh, all of them very nicely referred to uh, Mr. Lee as, as old man. Uh. So when old man called me, and, and you know the way they say it with such reverence, right? I remember like they were alive and working in a period where, you know, we're like, ah, return it's our CPF. A, it's a very special experience to yeah. work with the man. Yeah. So then what do you do for fun? Like, as in, does a minister have time to have fun? Before we talk about the definitely, <laughs> we first want to know what the minister of law do it's for fun. It's not so much fun. It's uh, more a case of uh, 
trying to find some downtime. I do a combination. I swim. I exercise. Yeah, yeah. You're doing. You're gymming now. I'm gymming. <laughs> same as, <laughs> same same as Jumbo. Too. Why never say same as me? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> I also gym. What the heck? Doesn't look as if you. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I just got a personal trainer like uh, okay, two weeks ago. Just Keyword started. just, 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 just started, okay. just started. No, no, I do other things too. You know, keep my mind still. Right. Yeah. Shall we get down to business? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, I think recently the more high-profile cases, so-called, have been those of uh, Malaysian Kawan Singh, uh, Nagendran, and also most recently with uh, Nazari. So we'll be going into these cases with more in more detail later on. So stay tuned for that. But I think off the top of my head, right, because there's been quite a marathon of appeals nowadays that's going on, right. So I think the first question I have is like, is there a limit to these applications that prisoners on death row can submit, or can they just keep like applying and applying and applying, and then it just drags out? Well, in Singapore, when a person faces the, a charge which can potentially lead to the death penalty, he's entitled to a lawyer. And if he can't afford a lawyer, the, there is a scheme that provides him with a lawyer. So everyone will have a lawyer. And they put forward the arguments. And they put forward the best case they can. And uh, there is a high court trial in the Court of Appeal. And uh, the Court of Appeal decides that's, you know, one way or the other. If it says, well, you know, on the law, he has committed an offence, say murder, for which uh, the death penalty has to be applied, or if he is trafficked above the certain uh, minimum amount, and you know it's clear that he trafficked. That number uh, always astounds me. Ah, uh, the minimum amount. Well, like two grams or something like that. No, right? no, fifteen grams of heroin. Gram. It can feed one hundred and eighty abusers for one week. How does that work though? How does so one divide something? So that is why people don't realize. When we put fifteen grams, it's, it can destroy the lives of one hundred and eighty people for one week. How is heroin? And it's not consumed? just uh, the one hundred and eighty abusers; <laughs> it is their families. So you're talking about a, a huge impact out of these fifteen grams. Right. And the moment we introduce the mandatory death penalty in in the nineteen nineties, the trafficking amounts came down by two thirds. People don't want to face the death penalty, right? So you know, immediately there was a cutback. But coming back to your question, after the court of appeal passes its sentence, eventually a date will be fixed. But what's happened is the lawyers are careful. If a client comes, people are entitled to make an application if there is new evidence, mm. something that wasn't brought up at trial mm. or something new. They're entitled to bring it up, and right. we don't say no. Or if they think of a new legal argument, they're entitled to bring it up. And most lawyers will look at it if there is a new argument or new evidence. They will take up the matter. Most lawyers will look at it, and if there is nothing new, they will say, "Look, uh, there is no basis for an application." Yeah. And uh, the court has made it very clear, Court of Appeal, that uh, you know if there is a legitimate ground, you should apply, but you shouldn't apply just to prevent the. Penalty from being carried out—that's an abuse of process right. because yeah. you have had full legal representation. Mm. So yeah. Singapore took a hard stance, right, on on drug trafficking. Was there a particular incident that happened in the nineties? No, we saw that, like that? Uh, the trafficking was increasing. We decided we needed to deal with it decisively, and uh, I would say you look at uh, two aspects. It was introduced for its deterrent effect, so you got to look. Has it been a deterrent? And two, what are the results? Right. The moment we introduced, the amounts trafficked fell by over sixty percent. Mm. Okay. Came down by two thirds. Second, you ask the drug traffickers who have been caught. They said, "Of course, we worry about the death penalty, and that's why we bring in amounts which are less." Even more interestingly, in the re- last few years, we carried out a survey in the neighboring countries from where our drug traffickers come. More than eighty percent—that's eight out of ten—said the death penalty is a serious deterrent. Mm. Nearly sixty-five, sixty-six percent said, "You know, it's more of a deterrent than life imprisonment." So there is a huge potential market for traffickers out there. Mm. But they all, because they know of our tough laws and because they value their life, they will not traffic. Above that amount, even if they want to traffic, because they know in Singapore the likelihood of getting caught is high, and then they may face the death penalty. 
but if we didn't have this deterrence you can work out for yourself so that's the first point deterrence mm. the second point is what are the results in singapore you talked about the 1990s in the 1990s we were arresting about 6000 persons per year for drug abuse by the way today we don't treat them as criminals right. they don't have a criminal record they go in for rehabilitation no criminal record they are given um, the opportunity to change they are taught life skills they are given education i mean they come out they are handheld by the state as and the family and other community structures to come in to help them right so you're saying if let's say i've been abusing drugs to the point where i realize i cannot afford it anymore yeah i can surrender myself can to surrender a public yourself. office absolutely and say i need help and you you're not going to ask me where i get my drugs from because what if i bought it from my brother uh, we which will i don't have it's such a safe question <laughs> <laughs> no okay. we will investigate but in any event you know you yourself the question is how will you be treated right regardless of you know you come in for the third time or fourth time you don't have a black mark for criminal offense right you're not mm. on the criminal records yeah you come in we try and treat you with uh, psychologically we try and treat you medically you know and we try and treat you socially as in we try and put in support structures the family support religious support if you are religious community support mentors and we also try and teach you some life skills work skills and we try and link you up with uh, employers right so that when you go out you can have a decent job what what has the success rate been for like this we have it's process? not bad i mean there are enough stories uh, it can always be better and we are working on it part of the problem is uh, internally the confidence and the the willingness and the determination to stay the course mm. there are people who are determined and they clear those who need more help sometimes fall back particularly with their old friends and then we help them again so that's drug abusers right drug traffickers we see as people who are making money by destroying your lives right my lives and my children's lives i mean i'm not going to take drugs i don't think you are going to but uh, many others can be tempted to yeah. okay and they they're doing this for money now what i told you we were arresting about 6000 plus in the 1990s today we are arresting about 3000 plus now singapore is richer today we can afford more drugs and yet we are arresting less people it's not because of our enforcement is less that means over a, something like a 25 year period quarter century we have been saving tens of thousands of lives from the bad effects of drugs right now that is the result and 97% of singaporeans feel safe walking home alone at night i mean boys one thing but you know you ask yourself you, do you feel safe walking home alone at night in singapore most girls will say yep. yes would you yes, feel like that yes except now hungry girls festival <laughs> <laughs> you won't feel the same in new york or london or you yeah. know many other cities yeah. right? right right now there is one other point here these people when they do this you look at what happens to families if the father is on drugs he is in jail the child grows up in a without a proper family structure sometimes both parents are in yeah. jail and uh, you look at the inner cities in the us one or both parents are in jail the child is surrounded by uh, drug traffickers it's growing up when you step out in to go to school on your way people are pushing drugs to you and uh, they asking you to become uh, drug addicts and then later on become drug traffickers in order to feed your drug habit mm. even if you are a bright child even if you want to study what chance is there you know people pushing needles guns everywhere uh, drugs everywhere all around you what sort of equality what sort of upliftment is there for these thousands right. of children and you so, see entire sorry, neighborhoods sorry mister i interrupt you uh, if yeah. so if it's if it's more of a deterrent right like you mentioned yeah, deterrent but also the you see the results right and and when western media or bbc for example goes on and talk about how how crazy singapore is by by enforcing the death penalty is there a win for you are you actively trying to fix their reputation or you feel like ah oh, good lah now well, more people know uh, well i think the deterrent effect is well known in the region and the more the international media talks about it the more the deterrent effect is put out yeah singaporeans uh, largely support the 
more than 80% support the death penalty. Are these deterrents effective when the individuals who, who succumb to or end up being the traffickers, right? More, more often than not, they are from the lower income groups. And, yeah. and I think when, when it comes to an individual who's desperate. No, the then, surveys yeah. are effective in the, or accurate in the sense that they are surveying the population which is likely to be the drug trafficker right, profile. Right. Okay. But as I said, 80%, more than 80%, about 83% believe that the death penalty is very effective and 66% believe that it is more effective than life imprisonment. But there will always be a 5-10%, 15% who nevertheless feel that they can take a chance. And if let me reverse the question. If I were to say in Singapore, if you are poor and desperate, then we won't impose the death penalty. Anybody else? Yes, death penalty. But if you are poor and desperate, no death penalty. What do you think will happen? Everyone who comes in will say he's poor and desperate, right? And you'll instead of one, you will have 100 traffickers coming in, right. all from the same profile. If I give you a profile, if you are 23 years old, no, if you are 19 years old and you come from a family where the income is less than 3,000 ringgit, uh, then you don't suffer death penalty. The drug kingpins will find all these people and send to Singapore. Mm. So policy, you need to be compassionate. But your compassion must start with being compassionate to the children in Singapore who could become victims of drugs. Right. And the people in Singapore, your policies have to be geared to the benefit of Singaporeans. And you need to be compassionate towards the people who have committed an offense. But at the same time, when they are doing something that can affect a large number of lives, then you have to be tough. Right. So I think like this is a good time to bring up the case of Nagarendran who exactly as like John Paul mentioned, right, came in desperate, right? He had like, he alleged that his family was under threat and that after that, it was that he didn't understand the law. So then to speak, as in speaking directly to this case, right, did his intellectual disability actually affect his decision making? Uh, his uh, own psychologist whom he, who was called, you know, the defense, he called an expert to testify on his behalf, mm. said that he was not intellectually yeah, disabled. Yeah. He knew what he was doing. Uh, yeah, I think the difference in the question is is more of that. How I, I'm, I'm more curious as to how it is determined whether they have been coerced or forced into a circumstance like this. And then how is that then, how does that then affect their sentence? Well, yeah. if you if you would, there are certain defenses in law where you didn't know what you were doing or you had no um, capability to do what you did, you know, you didn't understand what you're doing, that could be a defense. Or you did it something in self-defense, that can be a defense. But here you knew what you were doing. You are compelled, you just say, no, I'm not going. Right. And uh, he did it for money. The Court of Appeal said that he had a calculating mind. He mm. calculated the risks and the benefits and he decided to do it for money. Mm. So, you know, if you were to say, oh, you know, somebody threatened me and I uh, brought drugs in. And if we were to allow that as a defense, you'll get another 10,000 people who come in with that kind of defense. You got to be careful. Oh, so yeah. tough. Oh. Yeah, How do you even do anything like that? Then if I were to bring up another case, which I think we touched a bit upon just now, which is social support, right? So in the in the most recent case of Nazari, whose sister like in her media tour kind of talked about how he did not have access to like social support to help him get out of his drug addiction cycle. And he was only trafficking to fund his own addiction. And overall, he's a good man and therefore he shouldn't be executed. Well, you see, you I have a lot of sympathy for the sister. And you know, every person who is on the death row, we have to be sympathetic and compassionate. But compassion also is required for the victims. So when he was trafficking, and I don't recall how many grams, but I think it was well over 15 grams, you can imagine a large number of victims. I don't know whether you all saw in the newspapers, two weeks ago, there was a pregnant woman who was taking drugs. There was another child near her, six years old, and the drug-taking implements. And when the, the raid took place, she tried to climb out and get out. Mm. Now, there are three victims, the mother, the baby who is unborn, and there is a six-year-old child. Do you need to have compassion for them? Or is compassion only for the drug trafficker? So mm. if every drug trafficker who does it, and he did it for money, there were other avenues. There is Sana, there are 
you know, the mosques are in the project to help people. There are community groups which will come forward and help. And if he had wanted help, if he had come to the agencies, if he says, I need help, they would have given him help. Mm. There are many, many places to seek help. But in his case, he wanted to take drugs and he wanted to sell drugs. And by selling drugs, he was destroying the lives of many others, hundreds of others. Mm. And he didn't care about that. As I said, you know, we focus on the individual. I told the BBC, look oh, at- The interview was so irritating to watch. How do you feel? Uh, sorry, can we just go back there <laughs> no, for a second? No, but I want to respond to the point that was made <laughs> I, by reference to the interview. You know, one person, the sister comes out and she is uh, very uh, emotional on TV. But um, if you look at the WHO report, 500,000 people died last year from drug abuse. In the US alone, 100,000 people died from drug overdose. Who cries for them? What kind yeah. of community support did they have? They died because of the drug traffickers. You have uh, 30,000 murders in Mexico. These are large numbers, thousands and thousands. If you look at this region, the billion meth tablets were seized last year. It's swimming in drugs. How do we protect Singaporeans? Mm. These are very large numbers. So I told the BBC, you know, to quote, uh, misquote a famous quote, if one person dies, a drug trafficker, by hanging, that's a tragedy. If a million people die, mm. that's a statistic because the mind doesn't wrap itself around. How many sisters are coming on TV for all these other people who are dying because the drug trafficker is profiting from the drugs? Right. He is making money out of it. So can we talk about the BBC interview, a question I asked earlier? Yes. It was such an irritating interview to watch because he feels like he just wants to ask you a question but he don't really want you to answer. Ooh, can you speak candidly about this? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> He wants the sound bite, he go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think his style of questioning is well known. Yeah. Mm. And uh, we decided to do the interview knowing what his uh, style of questioning <laughs> was and uh, believing that uh, we have a point of view that can be put forward regardless of uh, the style of questioning. I said they know, they know exactly what the heck they're doing. Huh? Sorry, you have a question? Yeah, I have. So my question is because we have the availability of all this social support, right? But yet she is still claiming that he didn't have it. So then is the problem with like access or awareness and then is that the state's responsibility? I think that was what I was curious I, I think the real answer is it's not that people don't know. In order to, if you are arrested for drug trafficking, you will be given the support and then you are released. Drug abuse, you mean? Uh, drug abuse. Yeah. And uh, you are given a link, a link to an employer. You are, you know, given the sort of psychological tools. But that doesn't mean everyone can work at it. Mm. Some people give up. Mm. Some people find that the drug habit is uh, too powerful and they, they don't go back to the people who are helping them. Mm. So we can only help. We can't, you know, once a person is released, you can't keep control of him. Yeah. There has got to be, he's got to play his part too. Yeah. So he's got to come forward. The state can't be saying you have to come unless we know that he is abusing drugs. But, but if we but don't. But by then know, it's a criminal offense. La. Several people not only abuse, but they keep quiet about it because they don't want to give it up. Mm. Yeah. And then in his case, he went on to traffic as well. Right. Yeah. So I think the point here is that there's there's that choice that people have. Yeah. I think like I've always had the impression that if someone is trafficking, it's because they had no choice. Mm. They they had to do out of circumstance. But like you mentioned, there's all these there's that area where if you're broke, you really need to traffic for the money. Actually, there's all these social support. Well, systems. if you're broke and you want social support, there are uh, possibilities yeah. of support in Singapore. But you must be prepared to work too. Mm. You know, mm. there are more jobs in Singapore than employees. If you are prepared to work, you will be given a job. Mm. We can find you a job and uh, keep clean. And if you need psychological support, you get psychological support. If you need community support, you get community support. So all of it is available, but you must do your part too. So we forget the individual responsibility sometimes. Mm. So like yeah. if we zoom out a bit and look at the bigger picture, I think aside from whether or not it's a deterrence, another big argument against the death penalty has been the morality of it. So if we are saying that it's wrong to kill people, right? And 
why is it then okay for the state to be doing that? I think it's an interesting question. Now, the starting point is that uh, whatever the country does, state does through parliament, must be for the benefit of people, right? Mm. That's what we are in government for. You know, you pass laws, it must benefit the people in some way. So how does this structure where we have tough laws for trafficking, not so much abuse, how does it benefit people? That is the question. And let me start with an extreme example. People might think it's extreme, but actually then when you look at it, it may not look so extreme. There was a person called Anwar al Awlaki. He was born in the US. He was a US citizen. I think he had Yemeni citizenship as well. He was a very charismatic preacher and he preached terrorism and he lived and he hid in Yemen. President Obama ordered the US Special Forces to kill him. US citizen, no trial, nothing. Because he went on video and you know encouraged mm. uh, a certain interpretation of Islam. And he, drone strike killed him. Two weeks ago, Ayman Zawari is not a US citizen. US drone killed him. No trial. None of us thinks that's wrong, right? Killing ordered by the state against a terrorist. Now, if you put all the people who died as a result of uh, Anwar Awlaki's uh, speeches, it won't hit the 100,000 people who died because of drug overdose. It's okay to kill Awlaki without a trial through the use of drones. The state. It's okay to kill Ayman Zawari. Okay, he is head of an organization which has killed a lot more people. Mm. But it's not the case that whenever a state orders a killing, it's immoral. Nobody thinks that what President Obama did, well, there are people who think what he did was wrong. Okay, But uh, the state did it. The US did it. 40% mm. of the world's population, that's China, India and the US, those countries have the death penalty. 40%. They don't think... I mean, there are people within those countries who might say that the death penalty is wrong, but, you know, these are the three largest countries in the world in population size. And they are the number one and number two economies in the world, and India is either fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. So, death penalty, there are many countries that impose it. More people die out of drug abuse and drug taking than they do out of terrorism. In Singapore, if I were to tell you First, that drug is coming in has reduced by two-thirds. And there will be many more people who would have been on drugs but for our tough penalties. Second, that thousands of lives have been saved from drugs. Rapes and crimes go up tremendously when drug abuse is prevalent. Mm. Your children, or if you're too young to have children, your nephews, <laughs> they go to primary school, secondary school, they're safe. Many of them, some of them could have died if we weren't so tough on drugs. Now you tell me whether it's moral or immoral. But if we are talking about like harm that it does to people, right? How do we then decide that this is enough harm to warrant the death penalty versus say if we talk about like rape, I right? just told you that 83% uh, of the people in the region believe that it's a deterrent and 63% yeah. think that it's more of a deterrent than the life imprisonment yeah but so, so if there's note, statistic why changes not, why does rape then not warrant the death penalty because it is i would say causing equivalent if not more harm to the lives of individuals you must well. you must therefore ask what's the number of rapes in singapore it's a very low crime place primarily because we have controlled drugs people walk around the hawker center they leave their wallet as a choking exercise when they go in order food that's how safe singapore is so there are rapes, there are murders, homicides, but it's very, very low. Right. And uh, our punishment is tailored towards both the level of crime and uh, the deterrent effect. Also, remember, if you impose the death penalty for rape, you may get an unwanted consequence, which is that right. the person who has committed the rape may say, I better kill the girl because right. she may potentially testify against me. Right, right, right. So you need to think of the consequences too. It's okay. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
No, wait, so have you always been that sure of your position? For example, I'm sure there are times where you hear the plea of, of a sister or a mother and no, then you do I, question. I it's more of a personal you know, you question. You have to have, uh, in policy making, you have to have a hard head. Must be clear, but you must have a soft heart. You, <laughs> you must be compassionate. Mm. But I'm equally compassionate towards the thousands of others mm. who would be potential victims. Right. So... Compassion towards one, but compassion towards all the others. And the head says, this is the right way to do it in order to save the thousands of other lives. Right. So earlier on you were using, you were talking about the 80, 83%, right? So what happens if the majority or the statistic changes? right? In if, if the death penalty is not a deterrent effect, it has no deterrent value, yep. then you shouldn't have it. You know, a penalty should be imposed only if it has, uh, you are clear that it has a deterrent effect. Right, so it's constantly being re-evaluated. Of course it is being mm. re-evaluated. So it's possible that in future we might do away with the death penalty, specifically for drug trafficking. If it has got no deterrence, now just don't talk about death penalty. Any penalty, if it has no deterrence, you've got to relook at it. Because why are you imposing it if it doesn't protect society? So then, like, just now you mentioned a bit of, like, the regional... Uh, other countries who also allow the death penalty, right? So we've seen Philippines actually reintroduced it. Malaysia actually saying they are putting it kind of on hold. So then what are those repercussions for Singapore? Does their decision on death penalty regarding drugs affect Singapore? There are two parts to this. One, you go and ask how many Singaporeans think that we should follow, follow the laws in the region. You follow the laws in the region and the enforcement process, then your outcomes and the results will also be like the region. And is that what they want? Uh, we are not, uh, I mean, we are number one in the law and order international indices in many cases. Why? There is a reason for it. Because our police force is, there is very little corruption. CNB is very effective and uh, also very little corruption. I never say no corruption because there will always be some black sheep, but mm. very, very little. And, uh, People know that enforcement is tough and um, this public service is clean and we have clarity on how we do things. If you look at the region, things are slightly different. And I don't think Singaporeans want our systems to look like what is in the region. Now, what happens in the region, of course, has an impact on us. If they loosen up, then there will be more availability of drugs. And if there is more availability of drugs, it's a bigger challenge for us. We just have to deal with it. So I just wanted mm. to like carry on from like John Paul's question, right? So like say for example, if the survey still shows that it is still a deterrent, but you've also mentioned regarding other laws that if um, societal views regarding certain laws change, the laws should evolve. So if it's still a deterrent, but a majority of Singaporeans no longer support the death penalty, is that something that... A government that is uh, supported in a democratic system which is elected always has to take into account what the people mm. want but it also has a duty to explain to the people and persuade the majority to support its policies if we believe that something is right mm. and for example that it saves more lives and it is a serious deterrent effect then i think we have to go out and persuade and then if the majority are not persuaded you have to decide whether you want to be in politics mm -hmm. uh, or if you honestly believe in it but the people don't want it, whether you're prepared to change because that's what people want or you want to step out of politics. Those are choices you have to make. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, just <laughs> leave, leave politics. Or, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm talking about, you know, these are personal choices that people have to make. Yeah. And their conscience says that this is the right way to go, mm. but the people want something else. Then you have to decide whether your conscience is so strong and you feel so strongly about it that even though majority feel like this, if I can't persuade, I rather not. I don't want to implement something that I don't believe in. Mm. Those are mm. those becomes matters of conscience. Mm. So I think there are like two interesting points from two other cases. Uh, one of it is actually they're involved, like they were involved in the same case. So it's that of Kawan Singh and Nora Sheri. So actually there were three people. There are actually three people in this story. So there's a third person who is Muhammad Yazid. Yeah, so what happened was that Yazid got caught and then Yazid kind of pointed out the other two. Lah. Yeah, and Yazid actually got a certificate of substantive assistance. And Kawan Certificate? Si 
uh, that's they what, call that's it what it's yeah. called. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, when when you are able to assist the uh, Central Narcotics Bureau for in a way that allows them to identify who the kingpins were or you know what's the right. structure, and as a result, we are able to have some success there. Uh, a certificate is given to you by the Attorney General uh, so that you don't face the death penalty. Yeah. Right. So Kawan yeah. has actually his defense was that he deserves this certificate as well. But then he didn't get it in the end. So then, yeah. oh. the court looked What's at the it. What's the extent of of the yeah. aid that yeah. must be yeah. given? How many people you bought though? Then, or oh, that was useful information, I guess. Uh, no, you know the CNB explains it, and uh, the Attorney General looks at it, and they make a decision. Mm. Yeah. And for mm. his the fellow accomplice, right, which is Nora Shari, he, there was actually quite an interesting point because he mentioned that Yazid had lied to the police because they are from rival gangs. Yeah. And so when we're dealing with something so finite mm. as the death penalty, right, does the no, risk know, of false you, incrimination you, you scare? You must assume, I mean, unless you say everything that the drug traffickers say, we must take at face value. Yeah. I mean, you won't say that, right? Yeah. It's got to be assessed. It's got to be investigated. And then there's a trial process. So it's not whatever they say. I mean, they can say many things. Then it's got to be tested as to whether it's true or not. Mm. But speaking to how finite the death penalty is, right? Say, for example, even in the US, there are a lot of like death penalties that get overturned because they're the innocent to begin with. So in Singapore, do we have that same fear? And why do we not just impose life imprisonment instead? So because you believe that in some cases it might be, go wrong, therefore you shouldn't have the penalty at all, I think... It's a fair point that you're raising, but here, the logic, you know, you look at it logically, so-and-so says this, even though it's completely untrue. And because he says this, and because, you know, maybe it may be right, therefore, you shouldn't impose the penalty. I mean, that's effectively what you're saying, you see. Mm -hmm. the, the internet <laughs> Does that make sense? It's not my personal view. I support the death penalty. Does that make sense? Oh, you say that now? That's not what you said yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> see, that makes no sense, right? In the end, uh, whatever you say must be assessed, must be investigated. And then there's a court process, high court process, court of appeal process. And uh, you go through, everything comes out. Uh, the facts are there. It's only in cases where, first of all, the Attorney General is completely certain that the case is proceeded with, then the death penalty is only imposed when judges at the High Court and the Court of Appeal level are completely satisfied beyond reasonable doubt mm. that it is I guess made what up. is sometimes difficult for you is that you have to defend this system and then when people question the system, you do then have to say that the system and you is separate because their judgment is independent well, and people find that hard to believe. No, the, what is the point there, you see? The, do people think that, our, you know, when uh, the investigations by CNB are in some way flawed, mm. you know, the CNB reports to me, do they think that our police processes are in some way not right? If so, how is it that we are such a safe place? Mm. Why is the crime rate so low? Why do 97% of Singaporeans feel safe walking home alone at night? And why do the police force enjoy such a high reputation of trust? All of these are facts. Why mm. does Singapore feel and look different from other countries? Mm. And um, I mean, what is the point that, you know, we identify some victims and we put them to death? I mean, is that what the internet is saying? I mean, some crazy people will say that. But I think we look at ordinary Singaporeans. Mm. Uh, they believe that uh, it is the drug traffickers who are picked up mm. and uh, their cases are tried in court. And it's come, you know, yeah. the result. I mean, I, I, I kind of can see why people can differentiate drugs versus, let's say, a terrorism breaching preacher. Why? In that, not saying I support, ah. <laughs> in that, in that, even if let's say I'm a drug trafficker and I want to sell you drugs and I'm going to potentially screw up your life and your life when I sell your drugs, you're yeah. still going to want to buy it from me. Yeah. Whereas terrorism is, you are no choice. You're going on the way to work. I blow up your car, right? No, but then uh, I influence, our lucky influenced other people to do go and do the terrorist acts. Mm. Don't you have to look at how many people died? Yeah. What if more people die as a result of drug abuse? 
mm. then they die as a result of terrorism yeah what would your answer be no i completely see your point <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying i also see their point i feel like that's a fair statement back me up. <laughs> yesterday yeah. you say something <laughs> <laughs> yesterday holiday <laughs> ah. because i think a lot of our conversation today has essentially gone back to to very similar answers right and it's a very clear like line of thought that the state has but what the is of drugs, yeah. yeah but do you think there's something that people are overlooking when they are questioning the death penalty specifically no, it's ideological drugs? i mean as i said there are a few people in singapore mm. who are ideological and uh, who try and uh, work with international media to blacken our name they're not succeeding our name <laughs> is very strong 11.8 billion dollars of investments last year flight to quality singapore's reputation internationally has never been stronger it's very very strong and uh, the very same you, the bright, huh? you know it's like the, he actually play a part in it you know <laughs> like we also proud of india you have the international media but the people from those countries who are staying here mm. uh, there are thousands and thousands of them staying here they are not drug traffickers they are not drug abusers most of them mm. and they find the place safe for their children and they compare the safety of singapore with the safety of the places they come from mm. that's the first point second point is that in the media there are some uh, journalists who are who take an ideological view the facts don't matter your reasoning doesn't matter uh, i just don't agree with you and i want to be negative and i will say it mm. so you just have to accept it you can't run a country according to what some journalists want right from the time we were independent in 1965 the t- times of london various other british newspapers were constantly criticizing singapore and our model of governance and we prospered uh, very Despite, significantly mm. by ignoring them <laughs> <laughs> yeah just now we kind of you you did mention that like drug traffickers will deliberately traffic under that prohibited amount for example 15 yeah. grams of heroin so what yeah. if it's like 14.9 then what happens yeah then the person is not uh, f- doesn't face the death penalty enough lah right 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 wow. yeah. no, sorry sorry honestly yeah, honestly no, real yeah. question how how is heroin consumed 15 grams is like it's not injected no, based on shows I want you know then mix it with other it's stuff a, and oh, yeah. so 15 grams is of the pure After substance that you dilute, it's not yeah, yeah that makes more sense I'm like how 100 right. people divide this shit Like 180. I have a non-drug related question. No. Uh, <laughs> okay, we're running out of time, what, sir. What's what is a uh, what is a, a very interesting lesson you learned from working with uh, the late Mr. prime minister? Lee. Yeah, Mr. Lee. Yeah. yeah. As I said, it's a tremendous privilege because you know you're working with a man who was uh, really world class, Mr. Kissinger, who has dealt with world leaders. for a very long time more than 50 years he opened up between the US and China and met chairman mao he has recently written a book of six great world leaders that he admires and who have qualities of leadership mr lee was one of the six you know mrs thatcher mr lee charles de gaulle these are big names mm. and tiny little singapore everything he did everything he thought everything he said was geared towards only one point what is in singapore's interest everything he did he was tough he had a no nonsense approach but everything was geared towards how do i make this little island succeed and uh, he was brilliant he had tremendous clarity he was able to absorb a huge amount of facts he didn't waste any time from the moment he woke up to the moment he went to bed he didn't have many pastimes in fact i'm not sure he had any pastimes he exercised <laughs> He read <laughs> but he read in order to <laughs> think about yourself as well. He read in order to uh, also understand better the world. He kept in touch with all the latest developments, but everything he did was geared towards how do I benefit and how do I make this little island full of uh, you know small little island into a global metropolis mm. and how do I make people's lives better? How do I give them education, housing, healthcare? how do i make it defensible how do i have a good defense force how do i make sure there's law and order how do i make sure it's a democratic society that you know expresses the will of the people in in a genuine way uh, without the distortions of democracy that come from several countries in the west mm. yeah and then another question would be having been in politics for so long 
Like what is what is something that you've learned from from that experience? Well, you know, I as I said, I was very very I consider it one of my life's greatest privileges to have worked not for a very long time, but worked with long. Mr. Lee. <laughs> Uh, no, with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, first as a lawyer, uh, when I was in practice, then subsequently as a minister, a short period. But, you know, listening to his wisdom in cabinet, listening to his, uh, and he was prime minister and he talked to us as MPs. When he was senior minister, he talked to us as MPs. We went for lunches with him. You absorb a lot. You're like a sponge. Then um, oh, it's been a privilege working with, you know, I didn't work with him as prime minister, but Mr. Goh. I had a lot of dealings with him, mm. both when I was a lawyer and when I, of course, as an MP. He was a prime minister for most of that time when I was an MP, and then, of course, uh, the current prime minister. So I've had close ringside view of all the three prime ministers of Singapore. Mm. Right, right. I've but men like, like that, though, are they are they affable as mentors? They have the affable side, but when it's work you have to be focused on getting the results and getting things done. Mm -hmm. Because it is not for yourself, it is for the country. Yeah. And uh, you cannot let your affability and your personal feelings get in the way of working with your subordinates and colleagues. They mm. have to get things done. Yeah. If they don't get things done, Singaporean life suffer. Right, right. And therefore, they have to be strict. So right. everything they do, everything they think, every interaction is geared towards, well, you know, I need you to do this. I need you to do this because of that. And uh, the people who can get the things done, yeah, they continue to work. The people who can't get the things done, if you can't build the flats, as Mr. Lee said, mm. as one of his earlier ministers, he has to move the person out and he's got to bring somebody else who can build the flats. Mm. So whether your friend or not your friend is irrelevant. Whether the person can build the flats, can he build the roads, mm. Can he build the financial system? Can he create employment? Mm. That's what's relevant. Do you all like Lipak or be, you know, hang out, hang out, drink some tea? Or he well, keeps a distance because he needs you to because exercise. You can afraid of him. Because, you know, if you Lipak, other people don't suffer. Right. Yeah. If the Prime Minister does that, the country suffers. <laughs> you know, when you Lipak, my company suffers. Thank you, Minister, once again for joining us today, answering a lot of our burning questions, which we are very convinced by. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Most of you, we got nothing to say back. But yeah, so I think I hope you all have your questions answered as well, and you can leave your comments down below. Like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. coming, Minister. Thank we you. Need to do but men like that, though, are they? Are they affable as mentors? Mm. Right? I mean, they are trusting you with affable the future of Singapore. Oh, okay, okay. Like, are they likable as, uh, as mentors? I think the point friendly. is this, you know.